and gentlemen. I will extend a warm welcome to each one of you present here for the policy dialogue on, the, uh, on diversifying food system in Bihar for improving nutrition outcomes. On behalf of TCI and uh, Tata Cotton Institute and Asian Development Research Institute, I welcome you all to the policy dialogue. Thank you so much for being here. आगे बढ़ने से पहले हम आपको बताना चाहेंगे कि कई अपरिहार्य कारणों से माननीय उप उप मुख्यमंत्री श्री सुशील मोदी जी और मान्य माननीय कृषि मंत्री जी डॉक्टर प्रेम कुमार जी आज नहीं आ पा रहे हैं उन्होंने इस प्रोग्राम के लिए अपनी शुभकामनाएं भेजी हैं आज की सभा के मुख्य अतिथि कृषि विभाग के मंत्री श्री सुनील कुमार जी हम आपका स्वागत करते हैं आपकी व्यस्तता के बीच आपने जो यहाँ आने के लिए समय निकाला है उससे हमारा उत्साह बढ़ा है और हमने हम आशा ही नहीं पूर्ण विश्वास है कि आपके मार्गदर्शन से आज की सभा और चर्चा से कुछ फूड सिस्टम से जुड़े हुए संभावित नीतियों के बारे में हम विचार कर पाएंगे थैंक यू सो मच फॉर कमिंग सर बिफोर मूविंग ऑन With today's proceedings, I would like to take few minutes to introduce the two organizers. The Tata Cornell Institute for Agriculture and Nutrition is a long-term research initiative based on Cornell University in Ithaca, New York, with offices in Mumbai and New Delhi. TCI was established in 2012 under the dynamic leadership of Professor Ping Professor Prabhu Pingali, who is a renowned agricultural economist. TCI is working to create, test, and scale up sustainable and effective solutions for reducing poverty and malnutrition for impro and improving <coughs> livelihoods in different states of India. And Asian Development Research Institute is a non-profit civil society organization dedicated to research to social science research. Started with few sponsored studies in the early 90s. This institute gradually grew to be one of the major social science research centers in Bihar. Under the dynamic leadership of Dr. Shaibal Gupta and Professor P.P. Ghosh has recently uh, celebrated, celebrated its Silver Jubilee. Adi has been providing professional support to the government of Bihar on issues of development strategy and public finance as well. Thank you all for coming and raising the occasion. Thank you so much. I would welcome Agriculture Production Commissioner uh, Shri Sunil Kumar Ji on the stage. And I would request uh, Ruchi Rao from TCI to present the case uh, to Shri Sunil Kumar Ji. Thank you so much for being here, sir. <laughs> I would request Dr. Shaiba Gupta. I would request. specializing in political economy. Much of his work has been with special reference to the industrial sector in Bihar. He is presently engaged in a comparative study of political economy of Bihar and Madhya Pradesh and its implication for pattern of governance and growth in respective states. We welcome you, sir. Thank you for being here. I would request uh, Professor Prabhu Pingali to be on the stage. Professor Prabhu Bengali is 
the founding director of Tata Connect Institute and a professor in Charles H. Darcy School of Applied Economics and Management at Connect University. Professor Bengali has, uh, has held various eminent positions. Uh, he was the deputy director, Agriculture Development Division of Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation for about six years. He was elected to the U.S. National Academy of Sciences as a foreign fellow in 2007. He, were, he has also been the president of International Association of Agricultural Economists. He was also he was elected as a fellow of the American Agricultural Economics Association in 2006 and of the International Association of Agricultural Economists in 2009. We welcome you, sir. Thanks for being here. I would request uh, Agriculture Production Commissioner Shri Sunil Kumar Ji. हम आपका हार्दिक स्वागत करते हैं। हम आपसे रिक्वेस्ट करते हैं कि आप आकर हमारा प्रोग्राम का डॉक्टर गुप्ता टू गिव दी ओपन रिमार्क फॉर द फॉर द प्रोग्राम। थैंक यू सर। आई वुड आल्सो रिक्वेस्ट मिस्टर साश्वत गौतम, डिस्टिंग्विश्ड फेलो ऑफ आरजी, टू बी ऑन द स्टेज। Thank you so much, sir, for being here. Short 
notice before I proceed to let me state that the prime force behind this policy dialogue is Tata Cornell Institute. TCI had indeed received, conceived the idea and guided by Professor Pingali, but Dr. Nikhil Lal and Ashka Mittar from TCI have worked hard for this workshop. Their efforts were supplemented by Dr. Ghosh, our academic patron and guide, Dr. Somia Manjuna, Mr. Shashwat Gautam, and Dr. Varna Ganguly from RG. Agriculture and its allied sectors constitute the fulcrum of economy of Bihar and is indispensable in the context of trade, food security, sustenance, livelihoods of the state. The paramount significance of agriculture in Bihar can be testified from the fact that nearly 90% of the population dwell in rural areas and engage in agriculture, agricultural activities for employment. Agriculture generates less than a quarter of state's GSDP, but employs as much as three-fourths of its labor force. The presence of fertile magnetic soil, accessible groundwater, and abundant labor force has been a blessing in disguise for a historically backward and landlocked state like Bihar in the last couple of decades. Agriculture has been mainstay of state's development narrative. From food grains to wild seeds, sugar cane, fruits, and vegetables, the farmers in Bihar have been growing a variety of crops in recent years to cater to the growing demand. But more than 80% of the total cultivated area is still occupied by major cereals such as paddy, wheat, meat, etc. At the same time, we have more than 90% of farmers who are small and marginal in nature, who have limited access to resources to expand their production and engage in diversified farming like horticulture, floriculture, and animal husbandry. Though a due credit must be given to farming community, that despite many of these bottlenecks, Bihar was regularly featured among the top vegetable producers states in India. Agricultural sector in Bihar grew at 5.6% during 2005 and 6 to 2014 and 15, compared to the national average of 3.6%. <coughs> has been volatile due to recurring floods and droughts, variability in rainfall and various other factors. Largely, farming system in Bihar was focused on improving production, though use of modern productivity augmenting input such as fertilizer, certified seeds, machinery and technology along with support from government, mainly towards food grains such as rice, wheat and maize. However, we should understand the core essence of food grain centric production in a state like Bihar. It is not only provides the prospect of some level of stable income, but also caters to the need for basic food security for most of rural agrarian population. While the state has achieved commendable progress towards food security, the nutritional outcome of population is still rather low. The estimates show that the prevalence of anemia among pregnant women aged from 15 to 49 is 58.3% and among small children 6 to 59 months is 63.5% which should be considered acute. Bihar also faces the issues of malnutrition and stunting among children. The context I mentioned above merits a deliberation towards a more holistic approach towards farming and the role of government 
and the market is ensuring a better revenue for farmers and nutritional outcomes for the population. <coughs> you must understand that until and unless we don't incentivize the agrarian production with an equitable marketing prospect, pricing proposition, and investment in scientific research and infrastructure, the desired outcomes may not be achieved. This can be done by designing policy in a manner where farm productivity is closely aligned with the nutrient-rich food production. Similarly, the farm incentives directly reaching the hands of the farmer is established to help to create a balance between cereal and non-cereal agricultural production. The farming community in Bihar is risk-prone, hence it is important that there is a coherent support from the state in form of technological research, storage and marketing facilities, and prolonged price safety net to ensure this shift towards non-cereal crops. This would have twofold effects. First, it would help provide opportunities for farmers to raise their income, and secondly, it would address the issues of nutrient deficient food consumption patterns among the bulk of population. Bihar agriculture is highly vulnerable to risk of natural disasters such as floods, droughts. All these impose huge risk burden on the farmers, which limits their choices vis a vis diversification of their cropping pattern. As of now, most of the government incentive favors staples such as rice and wheat. For diversification, these needs to be extended to fruits and vegetables as well. Another point to consider is that our farmers are dependent on power for irrigation purposes. However, most of the farmers use diesel pump sets for lack of reliable electric or solar power for farm related purposes, which increases their cost and minimizes their profit. Bihar government is working towards establishing farm centric power transmission systems and promoting solar powered farms, which is likely to reduce the energy burden on farmers in coming years. Bihar is one of the most populous regions of the world, and despite its huge population density, it has one of the lowest number of banks per thousand population. This has resulted in limited farm and rural financial inclusion with a detrimental impact on agricultural credit on time to most aggregated community. This has been further compounded in Bihar due to non-upgradation of land records and high percentage of tenant-oriented farming where availability of farm credit is incumbent on availability of land position certificate. <coughs> One must note that farm credit is crucial for farm mechanization, better agricultural input, and timely farm intervention. Bihar also has huge scope for development of allied sectors such as dairy, fisheries, endowed with rich aquatic resources. Bihar is the ninth largest fish production state in India, thus providing information and incentives to augment production in dairy and fisheries can create new avenues for income generation and also promote relatively nutrient replete diet for population. Our panel discussion will be deliberating on these issues leading to productivity in allied sectors today. The Agricultural Roadmap 3 has planned for an organic corridor along the Ganges and this we need to introduce market incentives, improve infrastructure, design price support, and most importantly, certification of organic produce to encourage farmers to switch to organic cultivation and make organic food available to consumers at affordable prices. <coughs> Only farmer welfare centered approach will make will help in making development of agriculture in reality in Bihar creating profitable employment opportunities in agriculture can also attract the youth to participate in farming. Lastly, for agriculture to develop in Bihar, we need to create greater complementarity with other productive sectors by investing in value addition and food processing 
rural areas so that farmers <coughs> are not solely dependent on their harvest for sustainable income. I would also like to emphasize on the prospect of growth of economy of Bihar. In 2007, India became a trillion dollar economy. And now Maharashtra is expected to become a trillion dollar economy by 2024. While the engine of growth in Maharashtra has been both industry and agriculture, in the context of Bihar, it has to be agriculture. In this backdrop, in order to keep pace with development benchmark, we must emphasize on agriculture to bring about transformative change in short-range economic paradigms in Bihar. Now, there is the talk that by 2022, the farm income will increase by will increase almost double. In that case, the agricultural growth should be about 14 percent. No doubt, Bihar economy is growing, yet a lot needs to be done to ensure that agricultural growth is high and sustainable. The agenda for vital diversification is huge while keeping in mind the welfare of farmers and consumers. It needs to be inclusive so that growth benefits all such regions and segments of people. Therefore, there would not have been a more opportune time to organize this policy dialogue than now, which envisions taking stock of the situation of Bihar's agricultural production, challenges faced by farmers, and preparedness of the farming system to address nutritional concerns. The issues that I have outlined are by no, by no means comprehensive. My purpose here was to only underline some key areas in agriculture that are policy concern. I am sure that some issues will surface in today's discussion and we will take, we will work together to find ways to resolve them in the framework of our policy. I would like to conclude by stating let's work together to make agriculture a profession which is pursued not by no person but out of choice. The presence of senior functionaries from the agriculture department, members of the farming community, therefore most appreciated, and it would encourage us to deliver on current and future challenges in agricultural production and nutritional security in Bihar. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Gupta, for an enriching introductory remark for the program. Now, I invite Professor Prabhu Bengali to throw some light on the food system perspective on agricultural nutrition. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Kumar Gupta, Professor Shaibu Gupta, Sorry, so you know what I say? <coughs> Professor Shaibu Gupta, uh, Professor Gautam. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to be here today. And on behalf of the Tata Cornell Institute, let me also welcome you all to this gathering. Um, it's great to see such a large group of people here to talk about food systems and diversification of food systems. Um, let me say that. Um, the Tata Connell Institute has been thinking about issues of uh, agriculture and nutrition and its connection to food systems. And we've been looking at how food systems diversification is a crucial part of the strategy that India needs to pursue as you look at addressing the problem of malnutrition in the country, addressing the problem of stunting, <coughs> especially childhood stunting, and also addressing the need for meeting the demands for diversity as incomes rise, as middle class populations grow, and as middle class populations diet keeps changing. So these are some of the big challenges that we are looking at, and we're looking at opportunities for addressing these through changes in the food system. Why is this such an important issue? Why should we be thinking about the food systems perspective? 
But let's look at the basics. For the past 50 years, India has focused on addressing hunger, which was the right thing to do. India was focused on reducing hunger by looking at increasing the production of rice and increasing the production of wheat. And by all accounts, we should be congratulating ourselves for having done such a tremendous job in absolutely increasing overall productivity of these crops across the country. Of course, there's differences by region, but India as a country has become self-sufficient in food grains, primarily because of the enormous investments in research and enormous policy emphasis as that was put together for these two primary statements. So that was the, the good news, the great news, in fact, in being able to address the chronic hunger problem. Of course, there's still hungry people in India, but hung, hunger is not no longer an issue of not having enough quantity of food in the country. It's become much more an issue of access to so that's an issue that we need to be looking at much more carefully in terms of how do you improve access to better food for the poor. Now, the question that we have is we've addressed the calorie needs of the population through improved supplies and reduced prices of rice and wheat, but we've not addressed the overall nutritional needs of the populations. So we've seen that the extent to which pulses and legumes and vegetables and fruit and livestock products are produced has not been commensurate with the overall demand for these products. And that's been a big challenge. So even in places like Bihar and UP, you've seen that prior to the Green Revolution, you had a very diversified production system a production system that included pulses and legumes and millets, etc. Now, through the Green Revolution, much of these, this diversity got crowded out. Much <coughs> of the production systems in the Indo-Gangetic Plain became a rice wheat production system and pulses moved out of the system. Coarse cereals moved out of the system. So you went from a very diversified low yield, diversified production system to a high yielding, very specialized production system. And that's a challenge. It's a challenge because one, the, the price of the non-staple crops, the price of legumes, vegetables, pulses, etc., have shot up relative to state. And, and, and the access to these commodities has become much more difficult. So the very poor populations found that their diets have not been able to diversify in order to meet the needs of micronutrients, vitamins, protein, etc. And as a result, for the very poor populations, you begin to see high levels of stunting, high levels of wasting. And even the latest NFHS survey shows you those results very, very clearly. We've not been able to make as much progress in reducing the chronic malnutrition indicators as we should have been in this country. So that's, that's one of the challenges that a diversified food system can meet. The other is that as middle class incomes are rising, as I mentioned earlier, the need for diversity in the food system is rising. But middle class diets are also not keeping up to the extent of increasing their diversity, to the extent of enhancing micronutrient and vitamin intake in their diets. And that's primarily because the overall supply of diversity has been limited and the relative price of diversity has been very high. And so you see middle class populations tripping into processed food as a way in which you can create that diversity. So middle class populations are moving from a very stable grain-oriented diet to an increasingly processed food-oriented diet, 
which has its own health consequences associated with that. So when you think about it, whether you're addressing the problems of nutrition of the very poor, or the problems of nutrition of the middle class and the richer populations, the solution is the same. The solution is improve diversity of the food system in order to bring about increased access to a diverse set of food commodities, and also to reduce the overall prices of the non staples So that's where the challenge that we have in the food system to is today. Now, it's easy to say that. So why is it that you don't see farmers responding by changing the supply system and increasing diversity. As an economist, I would say, if prices are high, then farmers would be responding by increasing supply of those commodities for which prices are high. So why is that not happening? That's been an issue that uh, many of us have been thinking about for a while now. So I can give you several reasons why I think that's the case. I think one of the first and most fundamental reason is that agriculture policy is very much biased towards the big state hands. And agriculture policy does not adequately promote the non-staple production systems. So if you think about price support policy, if you think about investments in irrigation, infrastructure, etc., if you think about input subsidy policies, if you think about extension services and research systems, all of this is targeting increased production of rice and wheat. Now, I'm not saying one should not be looking at rice and wheat, but looking beyond rice and wheat is an important criteria. And looking at ways in which policies can be designed in order to reduce that bias that you have today in just focusing on those two commodities is a fundamental necessity that we have. And one, the main reason that we see a lack of interest in diversification is the policy focus that we have. So that's a change. That's a change that we should be looking at. And I hope today in our discussions we'll be talking a lot more about that. Second, I think, is around infrastructure investments. I think we've done an enormously great job in setting up infrastructure that allows us to procure staples, even from very remote areas. So staple grain procurement has a system that's established. And that system is based on the infrastructure, the market infrastructure, etc. for allowing that procurement today. We don't have a similar system when you think about vegetables, or when you think about fruit, or when you think about livestock products. The market infrastructure around that is very limited. So even today, smallholders producing vegetables can only sit by the roadside and sell their vegetables. You don't have a formal market system in rural areas and villages and district towns and in, in more urban areas where farmers can come in with their produce and be able to sell it into a more organized market infrastructure, which allows them the incentives to bring that produce into the system. And for procurement agents, private procurement agents, etc., to be able to, to get that procurement from those organized systems. So the market infrastructure around non-staples is very poor. Uh, simple things like uh, clean sheds for where selling takes place, cold storage systems, transport of uh, perishable products in a way that spoilage is minimized. <coughs> These are some of the infrastructure investments that are crucially needed. And today, the extent of investments in those areas is extremely small. I think there's a third reason why farmers are reluctant to move out of rice and wheat. And the third reason is that 
the knowledge required, the skill required, is significantly higher. Because of, when you're trying to grow vegetables or fruit, you're not just looking at producing quantity, you're looking at quality, you're looking at what's the best time to harvest, what's the best time to get it into the market, what's the best price to sell it at, etc. These are very complex decisions. And given the complexity of the production, processing, marketing decision, um, farmers tend to be a little hesitant to get into this, especially if prices are extremely variable, and especially if it's not clear whether you're going to get the returns to your investments. And one of the things governments could do better is to look at extension services that can help farmers through improving their skills and knowledge in producing these crops. The extension services around rice and wheat have been strong, have been strong for decades. But the extension services beyond these crops has been very poor. And I think that's where one can look at opportunities. And one can look at opportunities not just from the public sector, but also the private sector. And opportunities for public-private partnerships in these extension areas. Then the fourth area, I think, is around the transactions cost, the cost farmers face in going to the market and being able to sell their produce. As we all know, most farmers in India are very small farmers farmers with one acre, less than one acre of land. That's particularly true in Bihar. And for small farmers to be able to take uh, vegetables, fruit, etc., into the market is a very high cost activity. It's high cost not just in transport, but it's high cost in terms of the bargaining that's needed, in terms of meeting the quality standards, meeting the safety standards, etc. And, and our ability to reduce those transactions costs is a big uh, part of what's needed in order for farmers to be able to participate in these markets. And we need to look at ways in which we can do this. There are all sorts of experiments going on on creating producer organizations, creating cooperatives, etc., that help farmers to reduce the cost of meeting uh, the needs of the market and being able to sell it to the market. We need ways in which we can make that an easier process, promote more effective models, etc. One of the things that I notice in Bihar is the extent to which self-help groups have been moving across the state. Bihar has become a major leader in the women's self-help group movement. Now, is that a platform that you can use for also promoting uh, livestock production, vegetable production, fruit production, etc., Can these women's self-help groups be converted into producer organizations? Is that an opportunity? Is it something we can think about? So these, these are some of the big challenges that we are facing. Uh, we can talk about moving away from staples, but in order to be able to move away from staples, one needs very concerted efforts, very concerted efforts similar to the efforts that were made in India in the late 60s and in the 70s, when India made its big jump from being food deficit to a food self-sufficient country. I think today we need a similar scale of effort to move India from a country that's sufficient in staples but not in the non state to look at a country that becomes overall sufficient in a diversified and a more nutritious food system. I look forward to the discussion today, and I hope we'll get some good ideas on moving forward. Thank you very much. For development of allied sectors, such as dairy, fisheries, endowed with rich aquatic resources, Bihar is the ninth largest fish production states in India, thus providing information and incentives to augment production in dairy and fisheries can create new avenues for income generation and also promote relatively 
nutrient replete that for population. Our panel discussion will be deliberating on these issues leading to productivity in allied sectors today. The Agricultural Roadmap 3 has planned for an organic corridor along the Ganges and this we need to introduce market incentives, improve infrastructure, design price support and most importantly certification of organic produce to encourage farmers to switch to organic cultivation and make organic food available to consumers at affordable prices. <coughs> Only farmer welfare centered approach will make will help in making development of agriculture in reality in Bihar, creating profitable employment opportunities in agriculture can also attract the youth to participate in farming. Lastly, for agriculture to develop in Bihar, we need to create greater complementarity with other productive sectors by investing in value addition and food processing rural areas so that farmers are not solely dependent on their harvest for sustainable income. I would also like to emphasize on the prospect of growth of economy of Bihar. In 2007, India became a trillion dollar economy. And now Maharashtra is expected to become a trillion dollar economy by 2024. While the engine of growth in Maharashtra has been both industry and agriculture, in the context of Bihar, it has to be agriculture. In this backdrop, in order to keep pace with development benchmark, we must emphasize on agriculture to bring about transformative change in social economic paradigms in Bihar. Now, there is a talk that by 2022, the farm income will increase by, uh, will increase almost double. In that case, the agricultural growth should be about 14 percent. No doubt, Bihar economy is growing, yet a lot needs to be done to ensure that agricultural growth is high and sustainable. The agenda for vital diversification is huge while keeping in mind the welfare of farmers and consumers. It needs to be inclusive so that growth benefit all such regions and segments of people. Therefore, there would not have been a more opportune time to organize this policy dialogue than now which envisions taking stock of the situation of Bihar's agricultural production, challenges faced by farmers and preparedness of the farming system to address nutritional concerns. The issues that I have outlined are by no, by no means comprehensive. My purpose here was to only underline some key areas in agriculture that are policy concern. I am sure that some issues will surface in today's discussion and we will take, we will work together to find ways to resolve the framework of our policy. I would like to conclude by stating let's work together to make agriculture a profession which is pursued not by compulsion but out of choice. The presence of senior functionaries from agriculture department, members of the farming community, therefore most appreciative and it would encourage us to deliver on current and future challenges in agricultural production and nutritional security in Bihar. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Gupta, for an enriching introductory remark for the program. Now, I invite Professor Prabhu Bengali to throw some light on the food system perspective on agricultural nutrition. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Kumar Gupta, Professor Shaibu Gupta, Sorry, so I say, uh, <coughs> Professor Shaibu Gupta, uh, Professor Gautam. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to be here today. And on behalf of the Tata Parnell Institute, let me also welcome you all to this gathering. Um, it's great to see such a large group of people here 
to talk about food systems and diversification of food systems. Um, let me say that um, the Tata Connell Institute has been thinking about issues of uh, agriculture and nutrition and its connection to food systems. And we've been looking at how food systems diversification is a crucial part of the strategy that India needs to pursue as you look at addressing the problem of malnutrition in the country, addressing the problem of stunting, uh, especially childhood stunting, and also addressing the need for meeting the demands for diversity as incomes rise, as middle class populations grow, and as middle class populations diet keeps changing. So these are some of the big challenges that we're looking at, and we're looking at opportunities for addressing these through changes in the food system. Why is this such an important issue? Why should we be thinking about the food system's perspective? Well, let's look at the basics. For the past 50 years, India has focused on addressing hunger which was the right thing to do. India was focused on reducing hunger by looking at increasing the production of rice and increasing the production of wheat. And by all accounts, we should be congratulating ourselves for having done such a tremendous job in absolutely increasing overall productivity of these crops across the country. Of course, there's differences by region, but India as a country has become self-sufficient in food grains primarily because of the enormous investments in research and enormous policy emphasis that, that was put together for these two primary statements. So that was the, the good news, the great news in fact, in being able to address the chronic hunger problem. Of course, there's still hungry people. In India. But hung hunger is not no longer an issue of not having enough quantity of food in the country. It's become much more an issue of access to food. So that's an issue that we need to be looking at much more carefully in terms of how do you improve access to better food for the poor. Now, the question that we have is we've addressed the calorie needs of the public through improved supplies and reduced prices of rice and wheat, but we've not addressed the overall nutritional needs of the populations. So we've seen that the extent to which pulses and legumes and vegetables and fruit and livestock products are produced has not been commensurate with the overall demand for these products. And that's been a big challenge. So even in places like Bihar and UP, you've seen that prior to the Green Revolution, you had a very diversified production system, a production system that included pulses and legumes and millets, etc. Now, through the Green Revolution, much of these, this diversity got crowded out. Much of the production <laughs> systems in the Indo-Gangetic Plain became a rice wheat production system and pulses moved out of the system. Coarse cereals moved out of the system. So you went from a very diversified, low yield, diversified production system to a high yielding, very specialized production system. And that's a challenge. It's a challenge because one, the, the price of the non-staple crops, the price of legumes, vegetables, pulses, etc., have shot up relative to staples. And, and, and the access to these commodities has become much more difficult. So the very poor populations found that their diets have not been able to diversify in order to meet the needs of micronutrients, vitamins, protein, etc. And as a result, for the very poor populations, you begin to see high levels of stunting, high levels of wasting, 
And even the latest NFHS survey shows you those results very, very clearly. We've not been able to make as much progress in reducing the chronic malnutrition indicators as we should have been in this country. So that's, that's one of the challenges that the diversified food system can meet. The other is that as middle class incomes are rising, as I mentioned earlier, the need for diversity in the food system is rising. But middle class diets are also not keeping up to the extent of increasing their diversity, to the extent of enhancing micronutrient and vitamin intake in their diet. And that's primarily because the overall supply of diversity has been limited and the relative price of diversity has been very high. And so you see middle class populations tripping into processed food as a way in which you can create that diversity. So middle class populations are moving from a very stable grain oriented diet to an increasingly processed food oriented diet, which has its own health consequences associated with that. So when you think about it, whether you're addressing the problems of nutrition of the very poor, <coughs> or the problems of nutrition of the middle class and the richer populations, the solution is the same. The solution is improve diversity of the food system in order to bring about increased access to a diverse set of food commodities and also to reduce the overall prices of the non staples So that's where the challenge that we have in the food system to is today. Now, it's easy to say that. So why is it that you don't see farmers responding by changing the supply system and increasing diversity? As an economist, I would say, if prices are high, then farmers would be responding by increasing supply of those commodities for which prices are high. So why is that not happening? That's been an issue that uh, many of us have been thinking about for a while now. So I can give you several reasons why I think that's the case. I think one of the first and most fundamental reason is that agriculture policy is very much biased towards the big state hands. And agriculture policy does not adequately promote the non-staple production systems. So if you think about price support policy, if you think about investments in irrigation infrastructure, etc., if you think about input subsidy policies, if you think about extension services and research system. All of this is targeting increased production of rice and wheat. Now, I'm not saying one should not be looking at rice and wheat, but looking beyond rice and wheat is an important criteria. And looking at ways in which policies can be designed in order to reduce that bias that you have today in just focusing on those two commodities is a fundamental necessity that we have. And one, the main reason that we see a lack of interest in diversification is the policy focus that we have. So that's a change. That's a change that we should be looking at. And I hope today in our discussions we'll be talking a lot more about that. The second, I think, is around infrastructure investment. I think we've done an enormously great job in setting up infrastructure that allows us to procure staples, even from very remote areas. So staple grain procurement has a system that's established. And that system is based on the infrastructure, the market infrastructure, et cetera, for allowing that procurement. We don't have a similar system when you think about vegetables, or when you think about fruit, or when you think about livestock products. The market infrastructure around that is very limited. So even today, smallholders producing vegetables can only sit by the roadside and sell their vegetables. 
We don't have a formal market system in rural areas, in villages, in district towns, and in, in more urban areas where farmers can come in with their produce and be able to sell it into a more organized market infrastructure, which allows them the incentives to bring that produce into the system. And for procurement agents, private procurement agents, etc., to be able to to get that procurement from those organized systems. So the market infrastructure around non-staples is very poor. Uh, simple things like uh, clean sheds for where selling takes place, cold storage systems, transport for uh, perishable products in a way that spoilage is minimized. <coughs> These are some of the infrastructure investments that are crucially needed. And today, the extent of investments in those areas is extremely small. I think there's a third reason why farmers are reluctant to move out of rice. And the third reason is that the knowledge required, the skill required, is significantly higher. Because of when you're trying to grow vegetables or fruit, you're not just looking at producing quantity, you're looking at quality, you're looking at what's the best time to harvest, what's the best time to get it into the market, what's the best price to sell it at, etc. These are very complex decisions. And given the complexity of the production, processing, marketing decision, um, farmers tend to be a little hesitant to get into this, especially if prices are extremely variable. And especially if it's not clear whether you're going to get the returns to your investments. And one of the things governments could do better is to look at extension services that can help farmers through improving their skills and knowledge in producing these crops. The extension services around rice and wheat have been strong, have been strong for decades. But the extension services beyond these crops has been very poor. And I think that's where one can look at opportunities. And one can look at opportunities not just from the public sector, but also the private sector. And opportunities for public-private partnerships in these extension areas. Then the fourth area, I think, is around the transactions cost, the cost farmers face in going to the market and being able to sell their produce. As we all know, most farmers in India are very small farmers, farmers with one acre, less than one acre of land. That's particularly true in Bihar. And for small farmers to be able to take uh, vegetables, fruit, etc., into the market is a very high cost activity. It's high cost not just in transport, but it's high cost in terms of the bargaining that's needed, in terms of meeting the quality standards, meeting the safety standards, etc. And, and our ability to reduce those transactions costs is a big uh, part of what's needed in order for farmers to be able to participate in these markets. And we need to look at ways in which we can do this. There are all sorts of experiments going on, on creating producer organizations, creating cooperatives, etc., that help farmers to reduce the cost of meeting uh, the needs of the market and being able to sell it to the market. We need ways in which we can make that an easier process, promote more effective models, etc. One of the things that I notice in Bihar is the extent to which self-help groups have been moving across the state. Bihar has become a major leader in the women's self-help group movement. Now, is that a platform that you can use for also promoting uh, livestock production, vegetable production, fruit production, etc.? Can these women's self-help groups be converted into producer organizations? Is that an opportunity? Is it something we can think about? So these, these are some of the big challenges that we are facing. Uh, we can talk about moving away from staples, but in order to be able to move away from staples, one needs very concerted efforts 
very concerted effort similar to the efforts that were made in India in the late 60s and in the 70s, when India made its big jump from being food deficit to a food self-sufficient country. I think today we need a similar scale of effort to move India from a country. So these, these are some of the big challenges that we are facing. Uh, we can talk about moving away from staples, but in order to be able to move away from staples, one needs very concerted efforts, very concerted efforts similar to the efforts that were made in India in the late 60s and in the 70s, when India made its big jump from being food deficit to a food self-sufficient country. I think today we need a similar scale of effort to move India from a country that's sufficient in staples but not in the non-staples, to look at a country that becomes overall sufficient in a diversified and a more nutritious food system. I look forward to the discussion today and I hope we'll get some good ideas on moving forward. Thank you very much. Thank you so much sir, for sharing the perspective and helping us to look at food systems with nutrition lens. Now, I would request the chief guest of, for, the, uh, for the program, uh, Sri Sunil Kumarji, the Agricultural Production Commissioner, to give the chief guest address. Thank you so much. The inaugural address. We would request Shri Sunil Kumarji for the novel address for the Thank you. Shri Bhagavan Gupta Ji, Prabhu Gautam Ji, and this hall mein baithe hui experts. It's my privilege to this seminar. When Shri Bhagavan Gupta Ji has been here, उसके पहले भी मैंने कंसन दे रखा था कुछ कारणों से बिहार के डिप्टी सीएम और कृषि मंत्री यहाँ नहीं आ सके और उन्होंने मुझे अनुरोध किया इनागर सेशन में यहाँ पर जाने के लिए तो मुझे लगता है बिहार सरकार की पॉलिसी का एक क्रम है इसे मुझे यहाँ आने में काफी खुशी है इस हाल में बैठे हुए बहुत सारे वाइसर at two times in my career, I have been associated with education. One when I was part of the University Grant Commission, other time when I was part of the Agriculture Research and Education. And majority of the people in their organization used to be PhD. And by qualification, I have attained much more degree than graduation because the subject I chose to graduate was the electronics and communication. In this post graduation, I could do the PhD and the master's in that, and therefore I remained a graduate. But coincidentally, being part of the higher education, by default, many of the people in the meeting, they address the doctor's office, I have to stop them at many times. The agriculture production in Bihar, let me address the, my inaugural letter. Bihar is an agrarian state with about 20% of the state GSPP coming from agriculture and nearly 90% of the state population is rural in nature and about more than 70% of the population gets their employment from agriculture. When the 2011 census was to come, I was part of the urban sector in 98. By 2001 census, the Arab Bihar was one of the least surprised states. In fact, from bottom of the consider, only after the Himachal, the urbanization ratio was very low. And at that time, since I was part of the urban sector, we used to educate that India needs more urbanization. India in the year 2001 was only 31.8% urbanized population. And since majority of the government revenues from the urban, comes from the urban area, a major portion of GDP was coming from the urban areas and there was general education of educating 
first organization, and organization was linked to the employment, <coughs> coincidentally. Now if the talk is otherwise, the major employment is in the rural area, in the agriculture sector. Therefore, now as part of the agriculture sector, be educated that more emphasis to be given on the agriculture and rural education <coughs> system. Agriculture has experienced several transformations since independence. Sometimes like green revolution. Because of green revolution, the production and productivity of the rice and wheat increased substantially. Food grain production was 50.82 million metric tons in the year 50-51, which has increased to 252.22 million metric tons in the year 2015-16. That five times of the total production has gone And thanks to the policy makers, the financial institutions, the agriculture scientists, and academicians, which has led to the first green revolution. And it has got self sufficiency in the agriculture area. In fact, the India could dare to go to the parliament to bring a law in the name of the Food Security Act, which probably would have been a, would, could not have been thought in many of the countries in the world, have the regard to Food Security Act, and we could dare to well go for Food Security Act because of the steps taken by your policy makers, scientists, and because of the outcome of the green, first green revolution. Now, before the stock data I was getting, total food grain production we have achieved, and there are 12.69 million metric ton rice and 23.79 million ton wheat in the stock of government as on 1st January 2016. So we have become food surplus. <coughs> food requirement has been assessed as per the calorie requirement of population. Therefore, calorie requirement for rural and urban population was determined at 2400 and 2100 calorie respectively in the rural, urban and rural area. Beyond this, human beings need more than calorie element in food. And according to the National Institute of the Nutrition, the balanced diet for an adult man with moderate activity should consist of 450 gram cereals, 90 gram pulses. 300 million milliliter of milk, milk product, 200 grams roots and fibers, 100 grams green leafy vegetables, 200 grams other vegetables, 100 grams food, 30 grams sugar and 30 grams <coughs> And that is the topic what we are going to discuss today. Therefore, it is imperative that the diversification of Indian diet should now be emphasized after achieving self sufficiency in the food grain production. We have prepared a agriculture roadmap and this is agriculture third roadmap which we have launched by the His Excellency President of India by investing more than 54,000 crore rupees from the year 2017 to 22. We intend to bring the Bihar on the map where every Indian gets at least one item from Bihar in their thali. That's what we have Bihar by expenditure. That's what we educate for that. The agriculture on by aims at food security and it also locates our nutritional security, inclusive development, increase in farmers' income through sustainable production technology. The sense of agriculture roadmap lies in diversification of our existing food system. The agriculture roadmap envisages 53 percent. <coughs> increase in the rice production. 20% increase in the wheat production, 134% in the increase in maize production, that's our target, 81% increase in the pulse production, 260% increase in the RC production, 46% increase in the food production, 75% increase in vegetable production, 83% increase in the milk production, 392% increase in the egg production, and 24% increase in the meat production and 58% increase in the fish force. That's our target which we intend to increase by, uh, by 22. The cropping system in Bihar is primarily dominated by cereal. More than 70% of the grass crop area is occupied by the rice and wheat. The pulses area and production have remained largely stagnant. Therefore, 
a diversification of our existing cropping pattern is needed. Fruits and vegetables provide ample opportunity for diversification. The road map milestones are extremely challenging. Nonetheless, it clearly prioritizes the objective of agriculture development in the state. One copy of the agriculture road map I brought it, that is in English version, I will leave it to Dr. Gupta. And then if he intends, he can subscribe to the audience. And we have also put on the website of the Bihar Government Agriculture Department. The agriculture road map has identified seed, organic manure and fertilizer, improved farm machines and the updated crop technology. As critical intervention for productivity enhancement. Horticulture sector has duly been emphasized as sunrise sector, critical for income enhancement of farmers and also for nutritional security and population. Coming to the nutritional security, we have given a lot of emphasis on animal husbandry, dairy and fish sector. The animal husbandry and beef field that we cannot increase the income of the farmer unless we give emphasis for the animal species and the sector. So a lot of emphasis has been given to this sector. And we are giving emphasis for the agriculture research, education, extension, so that we can increase the, we can diversify the area of the agriculture, we feel that agriculture can't be treated in isolation. We feel that there is need for integrated industry where all sectors of the agriculture and life activities need to be educated, researched, and trained in the same field. Therefore, we in Bihar, we as on day today, we have three agriculture and allied activities in the state. One in the center, central sector, two in the state sector. But we are looking for integrated. We are giving lot of emphasis for fisheries education. We are we have opened a new fisheries college. We have opened many agriculture colleges, and also we intend to open more animal husbandry colleges in Bihar, so that allied activities must be strengthened. The agriculture sector has duly been implied as sunrise sector critical for income enhancement of farmers and also for nutritional security of the population. The agriculture road map draws extensive plants and breed improvement of animals and to protect animals against diseases. Basic infrastructure of bulk storage of milk and its processing has also been emphasized. Improvement in supply of fish, seed, and feed will increase fish production. It is no less important that a production milestone can be achieved provided we can assure remunerative return to farmers. That's one of the areas of the concern. We in Bihar have repealed the APMC Act. Now, we have to study the effect of the repeal or what is the alternate model method of the marketing could be developed. So I'll request the Professor Saiwan Gupta if we can take this study and if you can appropriately advise the Bihar government, so some method of the marketing system, whether I need to be interested, because we are very <coughs> concerned that APMC Act in the old form will never be brought back in the Bihar. That, that state government created policy. But what is the alternate method available to us? That also we need to be advised. Few days back, my neighboring state, Agriculture Production Commissioner, on the advice of the Chief Minister, the Chief Minister, asked us, what is the impact of the repeal of the APMC Act? Since we do not have the proper study done, therefore we could not apply it appropriately to the UP government, but not that need to be studied. And whether there is an alternate method in a simplified model could be experimented with that we need to study. But we have to ensure remunerative returns to the family. A robust agriculture market system is needed. That we feel if we intend to locate that farmer's income has to be on what parameter, what basis we are going to calculate the income to be doubled by 2022 or not that we need to study. A three about marketing, we have in the mid sector, we have experimented a very stabilized form of the cooperative federation that we call the cooperative model of the mid sector that is working successfully. We intend to do the same thing for the vegetable federation, three tier system, primary, intermediary, and the apex vegetable federation that been that part of the own agriculture roadmap that we are trying to develop. And many of the countries in the Gulf have also shown their interest to come to Bihar to get the vegetable to be taken to their country. 
and that we can do on this PWM marketing system for aggregation of the vegetable and processing and then for transporting. That's what we are trying to experiment. As I mentioned earlier, a network of the cold chain and food processing industry will provide much needed sources to the food diversification system in Bihar. The agriculture roadmap, as I mentioned earlier, is the integration of the activities of 12 departments of Bihar government. When we call 12 departments, basically four departments we consider the agriculture, industry, fisheries, dairy, and cooperative to that extent. And there are some supporting departments, what we call is the road, rural road, the water sources, the minor or major, land reforms, essence to the agriculture production, and we intend to include the more forest coverage for the Bihar. We intend to make it from 15% coverage as I'm to 17% by year 2022. And we intend to make the environment clean, and this is our objective to achieve by 2022. Today's deliberation, which is a creation of so many experts, will provide further light on how to achieve the milestone set for agriculture roadmap. I look forward to the outcome of the deliberation and assure you that a suitable solution will be implemented in the interest of the farmers of the state. With this, I thank all the people, especially Professor Gupta, who gave me a watch to come, in, come here and share the view of the, the argument. Thank you very much. And if you can appropriately advise the Bihar government, so some method of the marketing system, whether I need to be interested, because we are <coughs> concerned that APNC acts in the old form will never be brought back in Bihar. That, that state government created policy. But what is the alternate method available to us? That also we need to be advised. Few days back, my neighboring state agriculture production commissioner on the advice of the chief minister, the chief minister, asked us. What is the impact of the repeal of the APNC Act? Since we do not have the proper study done, therefore we could not apply appropriately to the UP government, but not that need to be studied. And whether there is an alternate method in a simplified model could be experimented with that then we need to study. But we have to ensure remunerative returns to the fellow. A robust agriculture market system is needed. That we feel if we intend to locate that farmer's income has to be on what parameters, what basis we are going to calculate the income to be doubled by 2022 or not that we need to study. A three about marketing, we have in the mid sector, we have experimented a very stabilized form of the cooperative federation that we call the cooperative model of the mid sector that is working successfully. We intend to do the same thing for the vegetable federation, three tier system, primary, intermediary, and the apex vegetable federation that we that part of the agriculture worldwide that we are trying to develop. And many of the countries in the Gulf have also shown their interest to come to Bihar to get the vegetable to be taken to their country. And that we can do on this PWM marketing system for aggregation of the vegetable and processing and therefore transporting. That's what we are trying to experiment. As I mentioned earlier, a network of the cold chain and food processing industry will provide much needed sources to the food diversification system in Bihar. The agriculture roadmap, as I mentioned earlier, is the integration of the activities of 12 departments of Bihar government. When we call 12 departments, basically four departments we consider the agriculture, industry, fisheries, dairy, and cooperative to that extent. And there are some supporting departments what we call is the road, rural road, the water sources, the minor or major, land reforms, essence to the agriculture production, and we intend to include the more forest coverage for the Bihar. We intend to make it from 15% coverage as I mentioned to 17% by year 2022. And we intend to make the environment clean. And this is our objective to achieve by 2022. Today's deliberation, which is a creation of so many experts, will provide further light on how to achieve the milestone set for agriculture roadmap. I look forward to the outcome of the deliberation 
and assure you that suitable solution will be implemented in the interest of the farmers of the state. With this, I thank all the people, especially Professor Gupta, who gave me the opportunity to come, in, come here and share the view of the department. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir, for such an enlightening inaugural session address. We are very happy that TCI and IFPRI have started already the APMC Act repeat per study. We have learned the finals of its learnings and its finals. We will share it with you. And the future we can do more studies, we will talk about it in the future. और जब एपीएमसी की हम बात कर ही रहे हैं तो हम बताना चाहेंगे कि जो लास्ट सेशन है इस प्रोग्राम का उसमें भी हम एपीएमसी एक्ट के जो रिपील ऑफ एपीएमसी एक्ट के जो इफेक्ट्स हैं इंपैक्ट हैं हम उनको भी डिस्कस करने वाले हैं सो इट वुड बी वी वुड बी हैप्पी इफ यू कुड इफ यू कुड इफ वी कैन शेयर आर 
fellow uh, from RG to give the four vote of thanks. Manya Siti Sunil Kumar Singh Ji, who is a BC man, I would like to give a thank you to him that he has given a great support in Bihar. He has also kept us in front of the Bihar government. He has also told us that what is the Bihar government in the future of Bihar government? और आने वाले समय में कृषि के विकास के लिए किस तरह की नीतियां बनाई जानी हैं इसका विशेष रूप से मैं ये भी धन्यवाद देना चाहूँगा कि उन्होंने विशेष रूप से रुचि लेते हुए ये भी कहा कि ए पी एम सी के एक्ट के रिफीलमेंट के बाद से जो बिहार के कृषि क्षेत्र के ऊपर प्रभाव पड़ा है उसमें वह चाहेंगे कि विभिन्न संस्थाएँ उनके साथ मिल करके एक एक नए विकल्प के भी बारे में चर्चा करें मैं डॉक्टर शाहबाल गुप्ता का विशेष रूप से धन्यवाद देना चाहूँगा कि उन्होंने एक बहुत बेहतरीन ब्यौरा और खाका प्रस्तुत किया न सिर्फ बिहार के कृषि के परिदृश्य में भी बल्कि कि बिहार की कृषि बिहार के पूर्ण रूप से जो आर्थिक विकास में उसका किस तरह का योगदान होगा और आने वाले दस साल या पंद्रह सालों में उसकी क्या योगदान होगा उसकी क्या भूमिका रहेगी उसका एक बहुत बेहतरीन खाका प्रस्तुत किया प्रोफेसर पिंगाली टोटल डाटा कॉर्डिनेशन इंस्टीट्यूट के प्रोफेसर पिंगाली ने खास करके जो हमारा केंद्रीकरण हुआ है आज के समय में आनाजों के प्रति उसकी समस्याओं के बारे में चर्चा की और यह बताया कि क्यों इसकी आवश्यकता आज के समय में है क्योंकि इसका जो प्रभाव या कह लीजिए क्यों प्रभाव पड़ रहा है हमारे समाज में विश्व बिहार जैसे जगह पर जहाँ पर उसका खूब प्रभाव पड़ रहा है न्यूट्रिशन के पॉइंट ऑफ व्यू से जिसका स्वास्थ्य के ऊपर सीधा नकारात्मक प्रभाव पड़ रहा है एक तरफ के ही खाद्यान्न के उपज होने के कारण तो उसके ऊपर उन्होंने बहुत बेहतरीन एक ब्यौरा पेश किया साथ ही हमारे यहाँ पे आए सारे उत्कृष्ट मेहमानों का भी मैं धन्यवाद देना चाहूँगा विशेष रूप से प्रोफेसर कामेश्वर झा जी चेयरमैन पोल्यूशन बोर्ड के चेयरमैन ए के घोष साहब और डॉक्टर पी पी घोष निखिल राज जी सत्यजीत सिंह जी मखाना इंडस्ट्रीज के डॉक्टर अविनाश किशोर जी डॉक्टर के एल पाठक जी साथ ही पूसा यूनिवर्सिटी के वाइस चांसलर प्रोफेसर आशीष श्रीवास्तव जी डॉक्टर रंजनी जी डॉक्टर भास्कर मित्रा जी डॉक्टर सुनीता लाल जी और डॉक्टर प्रवीण किशोर जी इसके साथ साथ यहाँ उपस्थित सभी गणमान्य अतिथि विशेष रूप से कृषि समुदाय से आने वाले लोग ऐसे युवा वर्ग के लोग जो कृषि के तरफ रुझान रखते हैं सारे स्थानों के एकेडमिशियंस और रिसर्चर उन सभी का हम आदरी और टीसीआई की तरफ से अभिनंदन करते हैं और आपका तहे दिल से स्वागत करते हैं कि आज के इस कार्यक्रम में आपसी दृष्टिकोण को हम आप एक दूसरे के बीच रखेंगे साथ ही ये जानने का प्रयास करेंगे कि बिहार की जो एक कृषि की हम जो सपना देख रहे हैं एक सतरंगी कृषि विकास की जो एक सपना हम देख रहे हैं जहाँ पर एक उद्देश्य है बिहार के मुख्यमंत्री का कि बिहार के भोजन का पूरे देश में हर थाली में एक बिहारी व्यंजन हो तो उसको हम पूरा करने के दृष्टिकोण में आगे आज किस तरह की नीतिगत पर्वों पर चर्चा करेंगे तो आप सबों का धन्यवाद और पूरे दिन भर के कार्यक्रम में उम्मीद करते हैं कि आपका सहयोग और आपका मार्गदर्शन करेगा बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद so much mr uh, sashwat mr sashwat uh, now uh, we break for tea for 10 minutes and we we'll reconvene for our panel session on diversified food in bihar and overcoming constraints related to that thank you